So this is being recorded for YouTube, um, and you can find that by just simply Googling YouTube and Genetic Genealogy Ireland, and that will bring you to our dedicated YouTube channel. Most of the presentations that you have seen this weekend are going to be up there. So uh, that's the majority of the presentations, and it's a great resource for everybody who is not able to make it to the conference in Dublin themselves. Now, in terms of identifying World War I soldiers, I'm going to talk about the identification process itself. I'll give you the example of Fromel, which was um, when 250 soldiers were found in a mass grave back in 2009. Um, we'll talk about whether the public databases that we are creating as genetic genealogists can actually help the identification process. And then I'll say a few words about creating your own memorial using genealogy and genetic genealogy. Uh, first off, uh, John Redmond encouraged a lot of Irish people to join up in the war effort in uh, uh, 1914 when World War I broke out. A lot of Irish men joined uh, for the glory of Ireland, and uh, there were many Irish heroes who fought in World War I, and one of the most famous was Sergeant Michael O'Leary, who became part of the general World War I propaganda at the time, how he uh, defeated ten Germans single-handedly, as one against a thousand, that type of thing. So um, there was a lot of involvement of Ireland in World War I. A million people died in action, uh, won over a million uh, men, 800 women, and 338,000 of those million people who died uh, are still missing from the British and Commonwealth forces. And the majority of those will be uh, lying somewhere on the Western Front. Over 200,000 Irishmen fought in the British Army, and this is a map that breaks down the more than 35,000 Irish men that were killed uh, during World War I, 10% um, of them at the, at the Somme, uh, 3,500 at the Somme, 2,000 from the 36th Ulster Division, and 1,200 from the 16th Irish Division. And this is a breakdown by county of the various known fatalities that happened of Irish men fighting in World War I. So how many soldiers of the British Army do not have a known grave? Uh, well, these data are based from March 2009, um, and the, they reckon that the those that are buried in named graves amount to over 500,000. No known graves, but listed on a memor memorial to the missing, uh, another 500,000. And of these, uh, about 187,000 are buried in uh, unmarked graves or unidentifiable graves, and therefore those that are not buried at all amount to about 338,000. So those men are still lying in the green fields of France. And we're finding about 30 bodies per year, so if it took a thousand years, we might get somewhere near finding all of those men. Here's just a map of the Western Front, which stretched from the uh, French-Belgium border on the coast, Ostend, going down through northern France over to northwestern France, over to the uh, German border just south of Luxembourg, and all the way down to Switzerland. And these are where some of the major battles occurred. Here's this, the River Somme here. That's where a large proportion of the World War I casualties took place. And there's also a um, Google map which actually shows you where recovery of a serviceman has been found. And you can see that it mirrors the, uh, the Western Front, that many of them were found on the rest Western Front. And this is where various people uh, were discovered over uh, various periods of time. So these remains are being discovered all the time. Somewhere between 30 to 60 soldiers' remains are being discovered every year during routine farm work, during road widening schemes, during excavation for building new buildings. Um, so, for example, in April 2016, there were 19 bodies recovered. Two of them were uh, deemed to be German, nine were deemed to be nine uh, Commonwealth uh, soldiers. Only two have been identified so far. You can see here that uh, the badge says Royal Warwickshire. So they were able to identify the regiment for the Commonwealth soldiers that were found. And this is just one example of these annual discoveries that occur as uh, farmers are doing their routine farm work. Now the usual process for managing these recovered remains is to contact the police, first of all, to find out whether it's a recent death and possibly a murder. And if they come out and say, no, there's nothing recent about this, it's probably war dead, then the remains are um, 
Uh, first of all, permission is given to recover the remains, and that recovery process may be undertaken by the local army uh, or archaeologists, or even the person, the original finder of the remains, if it was part of a, an archaeological dig, for example. In uh, Belgium, then the police write a detailed report, but if the discovery occurs in France, uh, where the majority of the finds will be, um, then it's the Commonwealth War Grave Commission's exhumation officer who will take charge of coordinating the recovery. And they'll also secure the artifacts and store the remains in a specially designed mortuary they have for that purpose. Then perhaps the identity of the nationality can be confirmed. And if the nationality can be confirmed, then the Commonwealth War Graves Commission reports to the member government uh, Ministry of Defence. So in the United Kingdom, it's the JCCC. In Germany, it's the VDK. If it is um, a British and Commonwealth uh, soldier, then the JCCC will coordinate efforts to identify that particular soldier. They'll be looking to identify the nationality, the <coughs> regiment, and the individual himself. And if that individual is identified, then the family will be traced and a funeral will be organized. That sounds like a very simple process, but in actual fact, it is hugely complicated. The process for identifying the remains is coordinated in the UK by the Ministry of Defense, uh, specifically the sub-team, the Service Personnel and Veterans Agency, specifically the sub-sub-team, the Joint Casualty and Compassionate Care Centre, the sub-sub-sub-team, Historic Casualty and Deceased Estates Casework Team, and the sub-sub-sub-sub-team, uh, which deals with historic casualties and war dead. That consists of two people. If you're getting the impression that this is quickly becoming an impossible task, I think you would probably be heading in the right direction. You know, if there are 30 bodies discovered every year, then two people, that's 15 bodies per person, uh, 12 months in the year, they have less than four weeks to identify each individual. That's if they're working at it full time. So you can see that there is a huge amount of work potentially um, that falls on the shoulders of these two people. So what happens when you discover 250 soldiers in a mass grave? Chaos. Absolute chaos. Um, the recovery team may involve a forensic archaeologist who employs crime scene investigation-like uh, procedures. It could include a forensic anthropologist like uh, René Gaper, who was speaking to us yesterday about the Barrymore project. And that forensic anthropologist would look to maybe to find the age, the height, the battle wounds, any distinguishing features like a broken arm, a broken leg that has healed previously. There may also be a military historian involved, a photographer, a project manager, and the aim is to identify nationality, regiment, and the individual soldier himself. Here's an example of some of the uh, finds. So here we have a, a, an entire tank that has been discovered. Um, here is some ammunition that has been discovered, and that might tell you the nationality of the soldier. I'm no expert on ammunition, but is that a Luger? Yeah. It is? Okay, so that's probably a German soldier that has been discovered. Um, the, the, the trench uh, tools that they use to dig the trenches can also tell you the, uh, the identity of the nationality of the soldier. And here we have Tony Robinson, probably with British trench digging tools, I'm not sure. Um, boots, uh, footwear, um, clothing. Uh, buttons can tell you the regiment that the soldier belongs to, and badges. And here we have again the Royal Warwickshire badge discovered in April of this year. Dog tags. Now, dog tags were introduced in August 1914 as a single dog tag. So a soldier dies, he has his dog tag on, the Germans come along and they take the dog tag to give it to the Red Cross so the Red Cross can give it to the family so they know the soldier has died. What's left on the soldier? Nothing. The two dog tag system was introduced in September 1916, which was three months after the Battle of Fromel, so it was too late for Fromel. So in Fromel, it was the one dog tag system um, approach that was used, and they couldn't um, uh, identify the soldiers by dog tags in Fromel as a result of that. 
Here's an example of some of the artifacts that might be found with the soldier. We have up here on the top left maybe a, an ink bottle, here's a spoon, here's a helmet, um, here's a tin. Uh, these are belt buckles I think here and that can be quite, um, I, that can identify the nationality of the soldier because they can be quite um, uh, distinctive. Here's a pipe, here's a brush, here's a book maybe. So these are the kind of artifacts that might be found with the soldier. And the process for <clears throat> identifying these remains is first of all looking for nationality and regiment and for, for this historical war records that detail the troop movements are very very important and also artifacts found uh, with or near the remains very very important for uh, identifying nationality and regiment. Sometimes the service number will be on the spoon. Sometimes the service number will be on the spoon. Soldier, soldier earlier this year, John Morrison, there was a spoon with the service number. So Michelle is saying that John Morrison earlier this year, Michelle was involved with the identification and uh, the service number was actually on the spoon. So that's quite a rare case and I should say that Michelle who will be featuring in this presentation is one of the genealogists that helped identify the soldiers in the mass grave in Fromel. So, and she did a very good presentation last year and I have a, a link to it in the uh, slideshow so you'll be able to take that down. Um, if possible, the individual is identified. Um, is a DNA sample taken? Well, up until about April of this year, apparently it was not, but now apparently it is, according to one of the uh, Great War Forums, one of those um, discussion groups that you have online. But how the DNA is taken, what DNA is taken, and what analysis they do, there's no information. Um, there's nothing on the official websites from the Commonwealth War Graves Commission or the JCCC to say just exactly what they are doing, what the process is for DNA sampling, and what kind of DNA they're actually taking. Um, the genealogy and the potential living relatives are then traced, working with volunteer genealogists like Michelle and um, Mel Pax, another one, and there might be, there's a couple of other genealogists around the UK um, that do this type of work, um, but I think it's so important to emphasize that this is volunteer genealogists like you and me. Um, if the relatives can be contacted, then DNA is taken from the relatives compared with the uh, DNA you've got from the soldier and the identity is confirmed that way. Again, it sounds incredibly easy. You'll see how difficult it is from Fromel. Question at the back? Male only or male and female? Uh, we uh, collect Y DNA and mitochondrial DNA, apparently, um, from, well, we did it in the Fromel project, and when they say they are collecting DNA, I'm assuming it's Y DNA as well as mitochondrial DNA. I don't know if they're collecting autosomal DNA as well, which is all the other chromosomes. So, like I say, we just don't know because there's no information out there. War records are a bit of a problem. Um, most servicemen's whereabouts can be located given a name, a regiment and a date. So, if you have a, a, a relative who was in the British Army, their whereabouts can be located by a, a name, a regiment and a date. Uh, that's, that's pretty good going and the military historian at Kew in uh, London is um, uh, able to do that. The servicemen's details exist for Canadian and Australian service files but the British records were burnt uh, during the Blitz in the um, uh, Second World War and only about I think it's 70 percent of them remain or 70 percent of them were destroyed. 60-something percent of them were destroyed. So it's about 60-70 yeah. percent of them were destroyed and it means what that the servicemen's... The, the burnt records are the ones that survive, um, not many... So, so it's difficult to actually get uh, servicemen's details, including age, height, nationality, ethnicity, date of birth, that kind of thing. There have been issues and concerned about the whole process um, expressed on a lot of these Great War forums, uh, World War I forums, Facebook, that type of thing. Um, primarily around insufficient efforts being made historically to identify these found remains. Um, the recovery of the remains, sometimes the farmers do not report them because there's too much delay, it's an inconvenience for their livelihood, and it's a loss of income, and in many cases the remains are just ploughed over, or they're bulldozed, and the, they're lost then. Also, the local laws and customs are not clearly stated or understood, and if they are uh, understood, are they actually observed and enforced? There's also a major problem with trophy hunters, uh, some of whom can be very, very aggressive, 
Um, Andy Robert Shaw talks about when he was on an archaeological dig recovering some uh, soldiers, uh, a live bullet was uh, taped to his windscreen of his car. So there can be incredibly, uh, certainly in Russia, I think, there is a huge business in World War I memorabilia. Also, the incentives to report soldiers' remains have been tried previously with detrimental effects. So, for example, you would get um, a bounty if you found uh, a skeleton and re reported it. So people split the skeleton in two and got two bounties. Wow. There's a reluctance to publicize the fines by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission and um, other Ministry of Defences. There's a lack of transparency as to the exact process. And DNA is not routinely recovered from the remains prior to reburial, at least historically. Is that still true? According to one of the forums, they're now collecting DNA since April of this year. Whether that is the case, I'm not sure, because there's nothing official. So, on to a prime example of uh, the, the recovery process and uh, the Fromel project. And there is some information um, about the Fromel project online. This is the Australian Army website. We also have the Commonwealth War Graves Commission website. So some of the information in this presentation has been gleaned from these websites. There's also a very, very, very good documentary which features Michelle, um, and you can see it on that particular um, link there at the bottom called Finding the Battalions, the Lost Battalions, uh, which details the whole uh, recovery process of Fromel. But most of the information that I'll be giving you is from these two books, Remembering Fromel, uh, which was um, compiled by Julie Summers and includes accounts from various people that were involved in the project, and also Remember Me to All, which was published by Oxford Archaeology, which was the archae archaeological group that was responsible for digging up the um, mass grave. So, Battle of Fromel took place on the 19th of July, 1916. It was a diversionary tactic in conjunction with the Battle of the Somme. So they wanted to divert German attention away from the Somme onto Fromel, and that maybe gives the advantage to the British troops at, at the Somme. Over 5,000 Australian casualties occurred, and it has gone down as the worst day in Australian <coughs> military history. Uh, 2,000 of them were killed, 1,299 were missing. Uh, there were 1,547 British casualties, of whom about 500 were killed. So you're looking at somewhere in the region of 2,500 people being killed during the Battle of Fromel. Now, a word about the numbers. The numbers vary because people are not entirely sure just exactly how many people were killed during this time. But um, the dead have been counted... Um, so, for example, at VC Corner Cemetery, there's a memorial for 1,294 Australian soldiers who are missing, presumed dead. It was initially 1,299, but five of them were identified in the 1920s. So now it's 1,294, and the five names have been cemented so that they're no longer visible on the memorial. There are 410 unidentified Australian soldiers buried in VC Corner Cemetery. And in nearby cemeteries, there's other unidentified Australian soldiers, for example, 266 in Rue David, 142 in Ration Farm, 22 in Rue Petillon, 72 in Y Farm. So, totaling it all up, there are 1,131 unknown Australian burials in total from the Battle of Fromel. And that leaves 163 Australian, Australian soldiers still missing and unaccounted for. Where are they? And that was the question that was asked by a retired school teacher, Lambis Inglesos, and he started investi investigating these unaccounted for missing soldiers. And he was joined in 2003 by Peter Barton, a very well-known military historian, who was also co-secretary of the All-Party War Graves and Battle Heritage Group in the UK. And then in 2006, the records indicated that there were mass graves for 400 dead um, dug behind Pheasant Wood near Fromel, and that meant that if there were 163 Australians among the 400 dead, there could be up to 240 British among 
those people in that mass grave. And when Peter Barton presented this to the old party uh, of War Graves and Battle Heritage Group in the House of Commons, that's when the British really became involved in trying to find the missing of Fromel. So in 2007, um, they located where the mass, they thought the mass grave was, and they did a geophysical survey which confirmed that there was eight mass graves in that area, and the following year, they did a limited excavation which confirmed that there were remains present. And thereafter, in 2009, they did a full-scale excavation of the mass grave. And you can mass graves were buried by the Germans? Mass graves were dug by the Germans, so immediately after the Battle of Fromel, and you can read about it in issue 44 of wartime, but immediately after the battle, for hygiene reasons, the Germans would have dug these graves and would have put the bodies into the graves. They were not dumped in the graves. They were actually laid out extremely respectfully. There were, um, <clears throat> there were even two brothers uh, put in side by side. So this is the site of the mass grave in Pheasantwood. And uh, the excavation took place between the 5th of May 2009 and the 16th of October 2009. It was a very warm summer, and they had to wear these crime scene investigation-like uh, suits to avoid contamination. Um, the artifacts were logged, the chain of custody was established, and um, here's a variety of artifacts that they found in the area. So here we have a Bible with some of the passages underlined. This is a boot, which is actually quite unusual because the British boots were much more comfortable than the German boots. So if the Germans found a British dead, they would take the boots off and swap their boots because it was more comfortable for the, for the Germans with the British boots. Uh, here is a gold cross. Here is either a pocket watch or a compass with some engraving on the back, but not enough engraving to actually give an identification of the person. And of course, the problem with these artifacts that have engravings on them is that, was this the belonging of the actual soldier where it was found? Or did he say, oh, Billy's dead, I must pick up his watch and tell his family. And then he gets shot with Billy's watch. So it wasn't possible to use these kind of artifacts for identification purposes. Um, here's a cardigan. Here's a very touching one. It's a rosary beads. Here's a money pouch. These are matches. Everybody smoked in those days. These are matches. This is a leather case for wire cutters to cut through the barbed wire. This is a return ticket to Perth that was never used. So altogether, 250 remains were exhumed and DNA was collected. First of all, it was collected from the people working on the site to form an elimination database. All those people in those white suits that you saw, they had their DNA tested to make sure that their DNA did not contaminate what they were excavating. Um, the collection was supervised by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission project manager and stored by the scene of crime officer. Uh, then DNA samples were collected from the bodies of the scene, again supervised by the scene of crime officer and transported to the DNA laboratory, the Forensics Laboratory, LGC Forensics in London. And they determined whether viable DNA could be extracted from the samples. Now the sort of samples that they took back in 2009 was a minimum of one tooth and one bone sample. Um, the tooth could be upper canine, upper second molar. Uh, the bones were metacarpals, metatarsals, those are the uh, metacarpals in the hand, metatarsals in the foot, fibula is the outside of the leg, the long bones like the, the, the femur and the humerus, uh, the radius and the ulna in the forearm, a rib, and of all else, a femur. Uh, so the femur was the last one because it's just so big and bulky and it had to be transported from France to London. They also sometimes use soft tissue, including hair, Achilles tendon, and even brain tissue. So uh, pretty gruesome stuff. Um, modern sampling in 2016 would dictate perhaps that the preferred area is the petrous bone, the inner ear, um, because you get four, up to 400 times the yield of DNA that you would get from these other bones. The DNA that they did recover was viable. 
They recovered it in low quantities and in a degraded form, but it was sufficiently usable uh, to obtain YSTR and, and mitochondrial DNA profiles for all of the buried soldiers. How many YSTR markers were recovered? Probably 17, because they were using the y filer 17 system to um, uh, uh, amplify the, the DNA and extract it. How many mitochondrial DNA markers were recovered? I don't know because it's not actually reported in any of the sources that I've looked at. In order to create a comparative DNA database, remember we've got the elimination database for the workers working there to make sure that they're not contaminating. Then we've got the DNA from the soldiers themselves, all 250 soldiers, Y-DNA and mitochondrial DNA. Now we need to compare the soldiers' DNA to something that's going to help identify them. And that something is the DNA from their relatives, from their family. Now, 250 soldiers were recovered, but we knew that 1,650 were missing, and they had to belong to that list of 1,650. Some of them were already buried in unknown graves or unmarked graves, unidentified graves, but we knew that the 250 soldiers in the mass grave belonged to a list of 1,650 soldiers. So what did we do? We needed a DNA sample from the families of uh, the 250, so we had to trace the families of all 1,650 that were on the list of missing soldiers. Now you can see the enormity of the task, and for this to fall on the shoulders of two people in the sub-sub-sub-sub team of the Ministry of Defence, it was a major, major undertaking, and they did very, very well to do as well as they did. They, um, well, they did well to, to deal with the barrage of information they were getting from the volunteer genealogists like Michelle and Mel Pack in the UK and various other people in Australia who were involved in the identification of the 1,650 um, genealogies of those um, uh, soldiers on that list of missing and unaccounted for. Um, they wanted preferably informative DNA donors, so it had to be on a, on a, on a Y line, so that's father, 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 um, a direct male line, and they also for the mitochondrial DNA, they had to be, it had to be on the mother, mother, mother line, going back towards the soldier, or his parents, or his grandparents, or his great-grandparents. Um, and there preferably had to be two Y DNA samples from each family, and two mitochondrial DNA samples from each family. That meant we needed 6,600 DNA donors to identify 250 soldiers, an enormous task an absolutely enormous task. This is an example of what an informative DNA donor looks like. If we assume that this chap fought in World War I, born in 1895, died in 1916, he would have been 20 years old. Um, there's his parents, there's his great, uh, grandparents and great-grandparents. If he had brothers who had sons, who had sons who were still alive in, in, in 2016, these would be informative Y-DNA donors. These are people that we could test because their Y-DNA would have been inherited from the father of the soldier. It would have come down that direct male line. Uh, for the mitochondrial DNA, if the soldier had sisters, they would have received the mitochondrial DNA from their mother, passed it on to their daughters, who would have passed it on to their daughters or sons. If any of these were still alive, they would be candidates for mitochondrial DNA testing because the mitochondrial DNA has passed down along the direct female line to these relatives and the soldier himself. If there were no brothers, supposing the soldier had no brothers, you go up a generation higher to a brother of his father and trace down that way. And if there were no sisters, you might have to go up two generations and then trace down. Look where you have to go back to. You have to go back to 1800 in some of these genealogies to actually get informative DNA donors. So sometimes it was an easy task, sometimes it was an impossible task. But the whole idea is to triangulate on this soldier with both Y DNA and mitochondrial DNA. And the triangulation is important because we're not just using the Y-DNA in isolation or the mitochondrial DNA in isolation. We're using them both together to use Bayesian statistical probabilities, which I'll show you shortly. 
sorry, I'll leave that up for you to take a photograph. So, tracing the living relatives by, was done by the Joint Casualty and Compassionate Centre in the UK or the Unrecovered War Casualties Army in Australia. They tried two methods. The first method was publicity. They put it in the papers, they advertised it. Uh, there was a petition for family to come forward who knew that they had relatives who fought in Fromel. That was successful in Australia. It was not <coughs> successful in the UK because Fromel was well known in Australia and everybody in the UK had not heard about it. There were local media reports on individual soldiers which did bring uh, local families forward. And there were road shows, shows specifically in the UK that did help um, identify some of the uh, soldiers' families. But the main method that was used to get informative DNA donors was the genealogy method, and that meant that genealogists like Michelle tracked down soldiers from the list of 1,650. The regimental groups and societies were very helpful and cooperative. Uh, Mel Pack in the UK traced most of the British families, along with Michelle, um, and small teams of dedicated volunteer genealogists did most of this legwork, and then sent this huge body of data to the two people working in the sub-sub-sub-sub team of the Ministry of Defence. So um, it was incredible, an incredible amount of work, and it required an incredible amount of cooperation, collaboration, and communication. And a lot of the time it worked, and some of the time it worked well. Um, this is Michelle's presentation from uh, Genetic Genealogy Ireland, uh, which was uh, two years ago, 2014. And you can see that on YouTube, on the Genetic Genealogy Ireland YouTube channel. Tracing living relatives was um, uh, very successful. And in most cases, uh, no possible genetic identification was achieved in only a very small number of cases, either because the family was extinct and had died out, or there was no informative relatives that uh, survived. There wasn't anybody on the direct male line. There wasn't anybody on the direct female line. So they couldn't get Y-DNA or mitochondrial DNA. And in only a very, very small number of cases, the families were unwilling to donate the DNA. That happened in three out of 277 uh, families in the UK. Uh, only Y-DNA and mitochondrial DNA was collected from these families, as far as I can ascertain. There was no autosomal DNA connected, collected from these families. But some of the DNA was actually collected from deceased people in the families, from medical slides or biopsies that they'd had at the local hospital. So there were extraordinary lengths gone to to achieve the um, outcome of this project. Also, there was um, an expected... NPE rate of about 1-2%. to NPE, non-paternal event, also known as not the parent expected, mm -hmm. either because of adoption or illegitimacy or infidelity, um, and they were expecting a 1-2% to uh, non-paternity event rate. They uh, observed a 2% rate, so they were bang on with that estimate. The actual identification process itself involved a data analysis team headed by uh, Professor Margaret Cox of Oxford Archaeology. Um, then there was a co-chair in, in Dr. Peter Jones. And then they had subject matter experts in anthropology, archaeology, molecular genetics, military history, uh, records, and statistics as required. Um, this data analysis team would review all the data that had been collected, not just the DNA data, but also the artifactual data and the age and stature and anthropological data. And then they would um, make a judgment on whether or not a particular soldier could be identified beyond reasonable doubt. And I'll talk about the identification standards shortly. And then they would make a recommendation to the Joint Identification Board. So the data analysis team were the experts the Joint Identification Board was associated with the Ministry of Defence of Australia and Britain. And they decided ultimately whether or not to accept the identification recommendation from the data analysis team. Then, uh, if they had, were happy that they'd made a positive identification, they'd then co contact the Commonwealth War Grave Commission to make sure that the soldier hadn't been buried before. Because uh, sometimes, and it happened in one case, um, some soldier was buried and given an identification based on scant evidence. 
And what they discovered was that, in fact, that was the wrong soldier. That wasn't the soldier that they had buried in that particular grave. The soldier that should be in that grave was the soldier that they just identified at the data, by the data analysis team in the Joint Identification Board. So the soldier's identification would then be passed to the relevant government minister, uh, the family would be notified, and the media would be informed. That was the identification process. The standard that they used for identification was the balance of probabilities for the army, whether it was German, French, British, um, but for an individual identification, there had to be clear and convincing evidence that indicates that an identification is substantially more likely than not. And in order to achieve that, um, they used a variety of different techniques, which I'll talk about now. But just a show of hands, how often did non-DNA evidence lead to identification, do you think? So we have non-DNA evidence like anthropology, artifacts. We didn't have dog tags, but sometimes we had inscribed uh, artifacts. Did that lead to that non-DNA uh, evidence? Did that lead to identification in roughly 10% of people? Okay, one about 10 people say that. About 50% of people? Okay, about six or seven people say that. 90% of people? Nobody goes for 90%. The answer is 0%. Okay? The first data analysis team met in 2010. There was no DNA available. They had made a tentative identification of only three of the 250 soldiers based on the artifactual evidence. So no positive identifications were assigned based on the artifactual evidence. The DNA was the only thing that allowed definite identification to be made, and that is one of the take-home lessons from Fromell. Without DNA, there's no identification. We mentioned already only one dog tag was worn by soldiers at Fromell. All personal items and ID tags would have been removed by the Germans to be given to the Red Cross. So the Red Cross could then forward it to the families, so that the family would actually have the possessions of their loved one. So, but it meant that there was little evidence left on or near the soldier to actually identify him. The DNA matching was in two groups. So they, they uh, took the DNA from the soldier and then they compared it to the DNA they had from all of the families and they tried to match them up. And there were two groups. Group one was where um, the DNA from the soldier matched a donor family's DNA, either the Y or the mitochondrial or both, with a very strong match probability, because it was maybe quite rare DNA and or it was an exact match, that type of thing. And the DNA uh, profile was not present in the elimination database from the people working on the site. And there was no evidence of an, a non-paternity event, adoption, illegitimacy, infidelity, that type of thing. So that was group one, a strong DNA match. Group two was not a strong DNA match, either because the DNA profile did not match any of the current donor families, there was not a match between any of the soldiers' DNA and any of the families, or the DNA matched from the soldier matched several of the donor families because it was a very, very common type of DNA signature. And that could have been due to a partial profile where they didn't get maybe the full 17 DNA markers, maybe they only got about 10 or 5. Um, it was maybe a very common Y-DNA profile or mitochondrial profile, or there were contradictory profiles, perhaps because there had been an adoption in the family and uh, there was a mismatch there between the profiles. Perhaps the DNA was only sufficient to identify a haplogroup and they couldn't do much more than that, or there might have been a suspected uh, non-paternity event um, from the family. The family might have said, we always thought he was adopted. You know, so that would have caused um, confusion. The strongest match probabilities that were observed in the whole project was, uh, for mitochondrial DNA, 1 in 1915. In other words, for this particular uh, comparison, the chances of it happening, uh, the probability of it happening just by chance is almost 1 in 2000. It's pretty good, but 2000 is still pretty low. Now, on the Y DNA side, uh, the highest probability they had of it occurring just by chance was 1 in 3,387. Again, using just Y-DNA alone or mitochondrial DNA, DNA alone, 
is not hugely convincing for a positive identification. But when you combine the two, so for example, if you have one in 1,915 on the mitochondrial DNA side and one in 3,387 on the Y DNA side, if you multiply them, then you get up to one in 6.4 million. Now that's a positive identification. You know, with 99.99999% probability. So it's the combination of the Y DNA and the mitochondrial DNA that gave this project its real strength. Um, and that didn't happen in all cases because they did not get um, Y and mitochondrial from all of these um, uh, cases, all of these, these soldiers. And then they employed Bayesian probability statistics to uh, arrive at this overall probability that this was a positive identification. And if you're interested in Bayesian probability statistics, and I'm sure you could devote a lifetime to trying to understand them, uh, there's a very good uh, presentation that was done by John Reed last year at Who Do You Think You Are in the UK, which uh, looks at the Bayesian probability statistics they used to prove that the skeleton in the car park in Leicester was Richard III, and therefore he should be buried in Leicester Cathedral. So um, that's uh, the fancy statistic that they used there. Um, sometimes they used haplogroup information. Sometimes it was quite useful, because if you have an unusual haplogroup, then that could maybe tell you where that soldier was from. So, for example, some people had Jewish haplogroups, genetic signatures that are found primarily in the Jewish population. And, of course, the religion of the soldiers was recorded on their service records. So if the service records survived and they, you knew that a soldier was Jewish and you found a Jewish haplogroup among the DNA signatures of the soldiers, you, there's only a couple of people that it might be. Also, um, Aboriginal, some Aboriginal soldiers were fighting in the Australian uh, ranks, Australian battalions, and some of these soldiers were noted on their service forms as dark, or darky, or half-caste, terms we wouldn't use today, um, but they did use them back then. Also, Eastern European uh, names were recorded uh, in the servicemen's records, and they could be matched with uh, Eastern European haplogroups, and the same for Scandinavian. Um, but these were not reliable. They were only used for supporting the identification and not for assigning the identification. They were merely a pointer or a clue. And that's important. Another pointer or clue was the Optimize um, program that they used, which was a statistical program based on nearest neighbor analysis. And basically what they did was they measured the height or estimated the height of all the soldiers. They estimated the age of all the soldiers. And then they put the age on the x-axis that's the y-axis, and then the height on the x-axis, and they plotted all 250 soldiers that way. Then they went to the service records and looked at the age and the height of all the people in the service. And they were able to maybe identify, just based on age and height, who was the most likely candidate for a particular set of soldier remains. And again, the optimized pro program did not make identifications but it offered the potential to speed up the process by using age and stature to link the remains of the buried soldiers with those missing soldiers' service records. Again, a pointer or a clue. Great starting point for your further investigations. If you want to see the science behind the story, there's a very good YouTube video from LGC Forensics themselves featuring Dr. James Walker and Victoria Moore. And on the 19th of July, 2010, the last burial occurred in Pheasant Wood Cemetery. Over the course of the subsequent six years, more soldiers each year have been identified, and those gravestones have been changed to have their name inscribed on them. Currently, as of September 2016, thanks to Michelle, um, 150 out of the 250 soldiers have been identified. A hundred remain unidentified. Some of them are, uh, some of those who have been identified are Irish. Private Harold John Burke, Lieutenant Robert David Burns, Private William Thomas Connolly, Private William Cullen, Private Patrick William Fahey, Private Percy Geeson, although I suspect it's Gleeson, Private Leslie William Hart, Private William Alexander Jameson, Private William Moore, Corporal Charles William Murray, Acting Sergeant William Holding Ryan, and Private Daniel Bernard Ryan.
So these are people with obvious uh, Irish ancestry who are fighting in the Australian forces who have been identified. But the search is still going on for some of the Irish soldiers that died of Fromell. Search launched for family of Donegal soldier. The soldier um, which the project is trying to match with his Donegal relatives is believed to be Joseph Curran, born in 1885, killed in action July the 19th, first day of the battle. Uh, his grandparents migrated to New South Wales from Crossroads in Donegal. Their names were Michael Curran and Anne Duggan, and both were born about 1837 in Crossroads. Perfect project for a local genealogist in Donegal. <laughs> and, and that's what we need. You know, as a community of genealogists, we can be doing a huge amount of work to try and find these people. Uh, here's another one from 2010. Search for relative of Irish lost soldier. William Kavanagh of A Company, the Royal Dublin Fusiliers, fell during the Battle of Fromell. Remains are believed to be those among the 250. 35 year old Private Kavanagh's regimental number uh, was 23042. He's married to Mar Mary Kavanagh. They lived at 5 Tyrone Place, Golden Bridge, in Shakur, in Dublin. He was one of 4,777 Dublin Fusiliers killed on various fronts during the First World War. They can be contacted at uh, commonwealthwargravecommission.org So again, trying to find his relatives. Here's another one from uh, last month, September the 17th, 2016. Marge O'Leary is starting a GoFundMe campaign to pay for a professional genealogist in Ireland to trace the remains of Peter Paul Shannon, or the relatives of Peter Paul Shannon in northern France. Um, they have exhausted our avenues of research over the past two years. Born in Ireland, uh, came to Australia in the 1890s. He was born in 1883 at New Ross in Wexford, um, and he joined the Australian Army in 1915. In Peter's case, none of his siblings had children, so we must look for DNA commencing in Ireland. The Fromell Association of Australia, a not for profit organisation entirely run by volunteers, volunteers, volunteers. You'll hear me repeating quite frequently how important it is that volunteers are doing this work. It's not professionals, it's volunteers, or it could be professional genealogists volunteering their time. But Peter is listed on the ancestry tree for male soldiers. So if you want to see if any of your relatives are on the for male soldiers list, go to that ancestry tree. And if you think you can see someone there and they need some help expanding that tree, please do give it. So lessons from for male. No DNA, no identification. No genealogists, no families to test, which kind of begs the question, are we adequately harnessing the power of our genealogy community to assist in identification? There were 1,650 families requiring 6,600 donors to identify 250 soldiers. Haplogroup data and optimized data were pointers or clues, and the identification process is ongoing, but how is it ongoing? Because the, they were only given a five-year remit, so now it's gone back to the Ministry of Defences of the company, uh, countries involved, and we're not entirely sure how that is, um, is going on. Um, one of the things that struck me from reading the books on Fromell was this paragraph here. In order to establish a familial link, it's essential to locate living genetic relatives from, if possible, both their maternal and paternal lines, Without living relatives, it is extremely difficult to match the DNA of a buried soldier to that of the family of a missing soldier, as the buried soldier's DNA profile, without an external reference, is simply an anonymous signature. But now there is an external reference, and you guys are the ones that created it, because we have public Y-DNA databases. And these could be pointers or clues that can predict the surname of males. We have Y-Search, we have Family Tree DNA, possibly the National DNA Database, I don't know, because I don't know enough about it in the UK. It might be just autosomal DNA. But also now we have um, the technological advance of sampling, the Petrus bone, with 400 times greater DNA yield, and the number of markers that are approved for this type of work in forensic labs uh, as far as I understand it, has increased from y filer 17 to y filer 23, and we might be getting 37 at some point in time, or as uh, Professor Dan Bradley was suggesting yesterday, 
get a DNA sample and do next generation sequencing on it, do a big Y test, get those SNPs, and then compare it with the, the SNPs from the family's relatives. So this, the public databases can be a pointer or a clue, and I'll show you why. Here's Y search. Look how many records are in there, 177,000, and 110 unique surnames. Family tree DNA, it has over 579,000 records in the database with over 400,000 unique surnames. So 3.3 3 times the number of records that are in Y-Search. Here's how you use Y-Search. Click on Search for Genetic Matches. Click here to enter any sequence anonymously, privately, without breaching the confidentiality of the soldier who has been and his DNA that's been found in the ground. Enter it in here into any one of these 100 um, marker fields and our drop-down menus for each of the possible values that you can input. I put in the first 19 markers from Gleason Lineage 1 in my Gleason DNA project. And what I found was there were nine matches. There is one there. This last name is Gleason. You see, you cannot identify any of the individuals. So the privacy and confidentiality and anonymity is still preserved. Unknown origin, unknown haplogroup, tested with family tree DNA, markers compared 19, genetic distance 0. So an exact match. An exact match. There were nine Gleason matches in the first 1,000. Okay? But not all of them were exact matches. So that only gives a signal of, if you like, 0.9%. It's not very strong. But if you look just at the exact matches, Gleason appears in three of the 13 exact matches. That gives you a single of 23%. So in this particular case, Gleason would be a prime candidate for the surname of the unidentified soldier. Do the same thing with uh, 12 markers. I enter 12 markers into this database and look what I got. Wheaton, Wheaton, Mallonby, Wheaton, Wheaton, Holder. Four out of the six exact matches were Wheaton. In this particular case, based on only 12 marker data, the prime candidate for this soldier is Wheaton. Then what they do is they go to the regimental list, they see if there's a Wheaton there, and there is, so then they go and trace that Wheaton's family, target that family, rather than all the families in the regiment, and then get them tested and compare it to the, the soldier's DNA. Now you can do the same with a family tree DNA, Massey Simmons, Massey Simmons, Massey Simmons at 25, Massey Simmons, Simmons at 37, Massey or Simmons. Look at the regimental list. Is there a Simmons or a Massey in that regiment? Um, here's one. Uh, Denman, 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 Denman. Well, that's a no-brainer, really. <laughs> um, 37 matches. There's a variety of names there. I had to go up to 67 to get two Gleasons and a Madlockham, and go up to 111 to get a Little and a Gleason. Uh, Gleason's most likely candidate, but I've had to increase the marker level to 111. So it doesn't work in all cases at low marker levels. How often does a Y-DNA test predict the surname? Around about 10 to 15 percent, based on um, data that I collected in 2014 at Who Do You Think You Are in London. 25 percent of men who do a Y-DNA 37 test have no matches. 50 percent have 1 to 10 matches. 25 percent have about more than 10 matches. And about 10 to 15 percent of these 130 that I looked at had a clear signal of their own surname in the results. And that is likely to increase in time as more and more people test. So future considerations. An unknown soldier is found, the regiment is identified, all families of the regiment's missing soldiers are traced and the DNA te is tested. Very, very costly. Instead, what you can do is narrow down via assessment for surname candidates, check the surname candidate against the regimental list, identify potential candidate soldiers, and targeted tracing and testing of that particular soldier's relatives, hugely reduced costs. And that is what will sell the project to the government. So I need to get them to listen. Uh, likelihood of being found. 30 bodies are recovered out of 338,000 that are known to be missing. The chances of your relative being found is approximately 1 in 100,000 per year. Remote. The likelihood of being identified, if we take a conservative estimate of about 10% using the DNA, is one in a million per year. 
one in 100,000 for 10 years, one in 10,000 over the next 100 years, if there's still viable DNA to test at that stage. So it's remote, but even one identification means something to somebody. Um, what can you do to commemorate, create a genealogical memorial, digital DNA memorial, or strengthen the online databases? Um, document your own ge the genealogy of your fallen relative. Put it up online with a paper trail for later independent verification. Identify potential living descendants for DNA testing. And leave a digital DNA memorial if you already have done a DNA test, including a link to his genealogy, the DNA data is available, and include your contact details. And you can do that either on Lives of the First World War website or Every Man Remembered website. And here's one that I left for um, my second cousin twice removed, Michael Spearham, who died in France. We know where he's buried, but I leave it as an example. Michael Spearham was my second cousin twice removed, one of about 10 children. His family tree is online at Ancestry, and there's the link. And that's where he's buried. And various relatives of Michael Spearman have undergone DNA testing. Michael's DNA is shared by the following people. YDNA, hit number AQHYD on Ysearch, 209715 on Family Tree DNA, his second cousin twice, uh, once removed. Mitochondrial DNA, no one tested, but cousins are available. Autosomal DNA, hit 221175 on Family Tree DNA, his potential is paternal for his cousin. So that's the kind of digital DNA memorial that you can leave to encourage people to actually start leaving DNA profiles for their fallen relatives. Um, you can strengthen the online databases by uploading your Y-DNA to Y-Search, uploading your um, mitochondrial DNA to MitoSearch, uploading your autosomal DNA to GetMatch, and then putting the kit numbers on your digital DNA memorial. Um, I have a World War I Missing in Action DNA Legacy Project on Family Tree DNA. You're more than welcome to join, should you so wish. And it's really just to leave, it's just a memorial, really, um, using, because we are genetic genealogists. But the whole purpose of this uh, process is to try and turn this type of gravestone, a soldier known unto God, into this type of gravestone, which actually has the soldier's name <clears throat> on it, and giving soldiers the dignity of having identification in death. So, thank you very much. I can see people queuing up outside, so um, we probably don't have any time for questions because it is now ten past four. So if you want to talk to me afterwards, I will be uh, around downstairs or tomorrow morning before the lectures. So thanks very much for your time. Can I ask you a quick question? Yeah, sure, sure. My interest in this is I have a great uncle who died in 1972, so I've had to leave. I've researched his whole war history, I know everything about him. He was in